Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, grab your Bible and turn over to the book of Galatians this morning. We're going to start over in uh, Galatians, uh, excuse me, <coughs> chapter 4. <coughs> Galatians 4. I'm excited about sharing this with you this morning. There's, uh, I shared this Friday night. I was invited to preach over at uh, Sister Joyce. Uh, Lane. Lane's, thank you for helping me. Joyce Lane's church. I failed to make make you aware of that meeting last Sunday, but anyway, we had a great time anyway. Amen. And uh, just the Lord gave me this message to, to share with him, and uh, I just feel that I need to share it again this morning with us. Amen. I want to talk about re redeeming the time, the time that we live in. If you don't watch the devil, he'll steal time from you. Yes. How many of you ever felt there's not enough hours in a day? Yeah. Anybody ever felt that way? Yeah. Well, you need to repent because God set it up the way he did because it's right. It's usually not that there's not enough hours, it's that we don't manage our time. Right. And there are those times when, you know, things are just hectic and so forth. But time is very important to God. And it should be very important to us. Amen. <clears throat> and I, I, let me just go ahead and read the scripture here first, and then I'll, we'll just share some things here. Verse 1 in chapter 4 of Galatians. Paul's making the, the case here for, he's, he's showing how, you know, uh, when someone is born into a family, let's say someone's born into a king's family, they're already in that lineage and in line. Somebody doesn't like my message already. <laughs> They're in that lineage and in that line to be king, but they're not ready to be king yet. Right? Right? You don't, I mean, they did it sometimes in ancient times, but you don't want to put a 10-year-old on the throne. Some parents nowadays need to learn that about their house. But anyway, we won't go there. So it says now, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth, no, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. In other words, he's saying that you don't put a young person into a, you know, that's not mature, not ready yet. The Bible tells us that we're not to promote a novice in a position of authority. We're doing them a disservice because they're not ready for it. And they'll be lifted up in pride and fall into the trap of the devil. Amen. That's why you want to wait and let God promote you. Because he knows when you're ready. Right. Over in the book of James, it says, don't rush in. In the, in the original Greek, it says, don't rush in to be a teacher. Yes. Because it says you'll have the greater judgment if you do that. Amen. In other words, God will have to hold you accountable to Amen. that level of accountability. And when you're teaching, you know, you're pastoring or you're teaching or you're in a, a place where you're, what you say and do affects groups of people, God takes that more serious than he does if it's just you kind of trying to figure your life out and walk with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you're going to do is it's going to affect others. Right. That's why you need to pray for your pastors, amen, right. and for leaders. So anyway, I'll try to stay away from these little rabbit trails. Verse 2, it says, But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed. Everybody say, time appointed. Time appointed. Now this, these words here, time appointed, that original Greek means a before appointed day. The Bible says that Christ was crucified before the foundations of the earth. God in eternity, I like what Billy Brim says, she says he cut out a piece of eternity and created time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> created the beginning and the end of time. Right. Amen? Right. Matter of fact, in our Bible we read last days, actually if you read that in the original it means end of days. Mm -hmm. And so this time thing God already predestined, he, he predestinated, see there's two wills for your life. There's the, the destiny of God that he has for your life in time and in eternity, <clears throat> or there's the faith of the devil that he has for your life. Yeah. There's two pathways that you can go, amen? And so how many of you know choosing God's destiny is the way to go? Amen. God has this path. See, that's what, when I was 29 and he confronted me in my work trip that day, that's what he showed me. He showed me a fork in the road and he said, here you are, right here. This is where you're at. You're standing right there and you're going to choose which way are you going to go today. 
You're going to follow me into my destiny for you, or you're going to go off into here and you'll get into darkness more and more and more and be deceived more and more, and the enemy will take your life. The devil can't just rush in and kill you, but he can deceive you if you keep walking with him into enough darkness to where it's like committing suicide spiritually. Amen. Moving right along since that went over real big. Hallelujah. So it's important. These things are important. This is serious business here, folks. We're in a, we're in a, a place where warfare is going on constantly. Amen. Now we don't have to be afraid. Because it says here in verse 2, there's a time appointed. There's already been a predestined day in time, it says, of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. He's talking about being under the law, the type and shadow of the fullness of spiritual truth which came through Jesus Christ. You know, the Passover that they went through every year in time. God, uh, you know, time is linear. God took time, and in his covenant with Israel, he made a circle out of time. He bent time into a circle, a yearly cycle. And then he put these seven uh, feasts, or these seven holy days, in this cycle every year. And he even had a weekly cycle. There was a Sunday beginning, and then a Saturday Sabbath, and then we started again. Amen. And, and that circle was designed to be like a protection. The people of God in the middle of it, and as long as they honored God from their heart and kept these feasts and worshipped Him in the revelation and in what He had required of them in these feasts, they stayed blessed and protected and prospered. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen? So He worked with them within time. And that's what's being talked about here. That all of those things were a way of God blessing and taking care of His people, but it was also a message about a future fulfillment of what those were types and shadows of. Right. Yeah. Who was the Passover lamb that they killed every year? What was the Passover lamb? Who was that a type and shadow of? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus became the fulfillment. That's why we don't go out and get a little lamb and cut its throat and, you know, do the Passover uh, every year. I'm glad about that. How about you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. But what do we do? We walk in the fulfillment of the blood. The eternal DNA life of God that's on the mercy seat of heaven that's continually, it says in the Greek, speaking and decreeing what has been established. Amen. So we walk in the light of that. So he's talking about an appointed day here. He says, let's read verse 3 again. For even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but yeah. when the fullness of time, everybody say fullness, fullness of time. Fullness. We read about time appointed back in verse 2. Now, And that's the time uh, before appointed or preordained time. There came a fullness of time was come. God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that they might receive the adoption of sons. In other words, no longer just a servant of God having to stand outside of his nature, outside of his family because of the sin nature that was in us. When Jesus shed his life and his blood, that paid the price to not just cover sin once a year, but to wipe sin out in your life to where a new nature of God could come and dwell in you. That's why we call it the new birth. The new birth, uh, born again, actually in, in John 3, means to be born from above. You became not no longer a servant of God, but a son of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But this happened in a fullness of time. Now, what is a fullness of time? A fullness of time is where God's preordained eternal purpose, something that He has always that he has always purposed to be forever true and established yeah. and is true and is established in the eternal realm. Yeah. Amen. See, our minds and souls are, are designed to function in this limited time realm and it's hard for us, even it's hard for us to even wrap our mind around how that God never had a starting point that he just always was. Yeah. Mm. Right. Your mind has trouble with that. Mm. Comprehending that sometimes. Mm. Amen? Amen. Right. But God, who always was, who always had this predestined purpose, He took His eternal purpose out of the, the eternal realm, the spirit realm, and here's the time realm. He intersected time with an eternal purpose, and Jesus came forth. Amen. 
Jesus was what? The, he was the glorified Son of God in heaven at the right hand or with His Father, in His Father and with His Father in eternity. Yes. But there came a point of time on earth where God had preordained and predestined that something powerful, someone powerful, out of the eternal realm penetrated into that time realm and a fullness of time came. Mary was impregnated yes. by the Holy Spirit as He overshadowed her and nine months later something eternally powerful came forth into the natural realm and began to manifest and offer an opportunity for people to enter into something that would be with them and in them forever. Now that is the way the the fullness of time thing works. The fullness of time. Amen. As we said before, time is linear. But, spirit, but history is cyclical. How many of you have heard this saying before? If we don't learn from history, we're, we're doomed to repeat it again. You know why? Because that's true. That's true. Why does, why is every, you know, you go back, I mean, we've got enough, you know, we've got in recent, well, not recent times, but in modern days, we can go back. I remember one time I found some material that my, my mother-in-law had at her house that was, a part of their Pentecostal denomination back during World War II. There were little tracts and books and things. I was looking at them, and some of them had Adolf Hitler's picture on the front, the Antichrist. Yeah. 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 They had him pointed out and figured, this, guy, this is him right here. This is the Antichrist. Well, he was the Antichrist yeah. for that generation. Yeah. There's probably more than one, but he won. Yeah. In other words, he had the Antichrist spirit operating through him. Anti-anointing, anti-God, anti-Jews, anti-church. Anything against Jesus, against what God's doing in the earth. Yes. <clears throat> See, there's been an antichrist for every generation. Right. Paul yeah. or John talks about, back in his day, 2,000 years ago, that the antichrist spirit's in the world. Yes. Amen? Amen? But there comes a time where, you know, and, and, and what I was going to say is that if we don't learn from that, we just keep cycling through that. Yeah. We're finding ourselves right now in our nation back to a place that we were uh, back in the in the 60s. Yes, come on. If you haven't lived through that, you don't even know what I'm talking about, bro. But those of us that have lived through it, we see it. We get it. And back, see, and when we shifted from the 60s into the 70s, the Jesus movement happened, the charismatic movement began to, to pick up, and people in the Catholic Church started getting filled with the Holy Spirit. All yes. kinds of things. Barriers were broken. God began to move in the earth, but uh, most of the people didn't pick up on that. Even the denominations and churches didn't pick up on it. And so we kind of stayed in our little pathway, walking in our little circle, and now here we are back again. Yeah. Oh. And what this is for us is the, another opportunity yes. Yes. for us to have, not that we didn't receive some things back then and good things happened, but the fullness yes. of what God wanted to happen didn't happen. And He's offered us another opportunity. And I'm kind of getting off my subject here to a certain degree. But, but I wanted you to understand this fullness of time thing. Now turn with me over to Luke 4. Tammy's getting it over there, isn't she? Hallelujah. I love it. Jumping out of your seat? Yes, Oh, okay. That's okay. Luke 4. Now, how many of you know what the word cotton, the Greek word kairos means? You've been around here for a while, you probably do it. It means spiritual season. Yeah. There's natural seasons that are based on time. Kronos is the word in the, in the Greek for, for natural time, a succession of moments. But there's a word in the, in the uh, Greek that's used in the New Testament, and that word is kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. And what kairos means, it means that which time gives you opportunity to accomplish or do. In other words, it's what we were talking about. It's that spiritual purpose of God intersecting you at a point of time or history in your life where you have the opportunity, just like Mary was encountered by God through Gabriel the angel, and he said, you have been chosen to do this, and God's going to do this through you. He's going to do something supernaturally, spiritually, miraculous through your life. He's going to He's going to penetrate into the time realm with something miraculous. Things are going to happen like they don't happen normally. Right. Amen. 
And Mary says, well, I don't get it. How, do, how, do, how can this happen without me having known a man? And he said, the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. And the power of the Most High is going to come upon you. And the thing that's going to be born of you Amen. is going to be of God. Amen. She said, be it unto me according to your word. Amen. And I'll open up the womb of her heart. Yes. Which allowed the Spirit of God to come in and to impregnate her both spiritually and physically for God's purpose to be born. Yeah. Something supernatural, powerful that changed the world forever. Yeah. Yeah. Because she understood her Kairos. Yeah. 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 Come on, come on. She didn't say, this is weird. No. I wonder if you're really an angel. <laughs> but yeah. look, look what's going on in society. The Romans have... God said in His Word in Deuteronomy it'd be like the days of heaven on earth, but this is like the days of, of hell on earth. Yeah. Yes. My people are being murdered wholesale. They're being crucified and strung along the roads to, to you know, use fear tactics to keep us in our place under the Roman Empire thumb. And, and you know, we've been crying out and praying for years for Elijah to come and, and King Messiah to come. I, I just, man, I, this, is not, this, is a, this is not a time where miraculous things can happen. And see, that's the way the world thinks. Yes. Man. They go by the deception of the day. Yes. 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 You go to a restaurant, they have the soup of the day. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, the devil has the deception of the that's day. Right. Now, let me tell you something. If you go back and study church history, you'll find in the most least likely, unlikely times of certain things beginning was when they began. Yeah. You know why? Because the devil knows. I don't know how he knows, but he knows some things about something big is getting ready to happen. I've got to turn down the screws on these people, distract them, get them in strife with each other, yeah. cause there to be anything but the love of God yeah. and submitting to God and yielding to God and going with God's purpose. I've got to get them so focused on uh, things around them and the dust clouds that I'm stirring up around them and you know, being at one another or whatever that they can't, they won't even be aware of what spiritual season they're in. Yeah. And the leadership of the nation in Israel, that's where they were at. Yes, that's right. Remember Jesus? <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus speaking to them. I won't, we won't turn there, but it's over in Luke. Luke 19, verses 41 through 40, 44, where the leadership, the PhDs, you know, spiritually of the, of the land, where they're talking to Jesus, and he looked at them and he said, you guys can tell me whether it's going to rain to not, tomorrow or not by looking at the clouds. Yeah. Right. You can tell the natural things that are going to... You can even predict the future tomorrow mm -hmm. by natural things around you in natural time and natural season. But you don't know the signs of the time. Yeah. And that word times, you look it up, it's the word kairos. He said, you're not, you're not aware of the things that are happening around you that are miraculous messages to you. Yes! That you are in a, a, a spiritual season with God where He is intersecting time with His eternal purpose to do something on this earth. Yeah. Yeah. Good, 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 good. God's standing on two legs, looking him in the face, and they couldn't tell who he was. Now, see, we, we, we hear that and we go, oh my God, that's horrible. But you know what? It'd be real easy for a matter of fact, I've done that. I've had God doing something right in front of me and I couldn't tell what it was. Man. Until I quit thinking carnally and got rid of my opinion Come on. and stepped back and said, Lord, teach me. See, Moses, when Moses led the children of Israel out of uh, Egypt, got them out in the wilderness, and you know, <laughs> God had taken the most powerful nation on the face of the earth that type of part to set them free. They get out there and they don't have a sandwich for lunch and they, they start cursing God. Come on. Come on. Isn't that amazing? Yes. But how easily are we distracted sometimes? Yep. And, and God finally, it says over in the book of Psalms, it says, Moses, or that the children of Israel saw my works. They saw the results of me doing something, but they didn't know my ways. Moses knew my ways. See, there's a way God does things. Amen. There are supernatural ways He communicates to us 
One of them is just simply honoring God and sitting down and taking your Bible and saying, here I am, Jesus, talk to me. Yes. And if you make a commitment to do that, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to teach you on the level of revelation where you're going to see and understand things about God that are not plainly seen necessarily in natural circumstance. Yes. Sometimes He'll move in natural ways. He does confirm things that way. But God has, he, he's, he moves prophetically through His people by yes. revelation, yes. by dreams, by visions. Amen. 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 And that's a whole different subject. But the point I wanted you to see is, is that these, these spiritual seasons, they come when God's timing is right. The devil knows that, so he tries to create in the natural realm and in the minds of God's people and everybody else in the world a perception that it's not that time or that doesn't exist but this is what you need to focus on. Come on. It's like most of the church knows more about probably the tribulation and the antichrist than they do where we're at right now spiritually. Amen. 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 It's true. It's true. Most people think the book of Revelation is about the antichrist. It's not. You don't believe me? Turn to, turn to Revelation in your Bible and look at the, the, the page that introduces the book. It'll say the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, the enemy is a master at just shifting you. You know, emphasize on the wrong thing, that kind of thing. Come on, you have come to be committed on. to be a disciple and press in and dig in and say, God, I don't want to miss my day of visitation. Come on. I want to hear what you have to say to me, and I want to Thank see you. what you have to say to me. Now, here in Luke 4, Thank you, Lord. of course, you know that Jesus had just been baptized in water, spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying. The devil came and attacked him and tried to get him to, to sin and bow his knee to him. He defeated the devil with the word of God. And then it says uh, <clears throat> here in verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught, nope, notice what he's doing teaching in their synagogue. Yeah. You know, one thing that kind of bugs me a little bit about the generation today is they, they want all of the fireworks without the teaching. Yes. Now, I'm not against the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, oh, dear God, no, I'm not against the gifts. I'm for the power of God. I'm for healing. I'm for signs. I'm for wonders. But let me tell you something. The anointing will break the yoke, but the devil still has some chains laying around and some yokes exactly. laying around. Exactly. And if you don't get taught and know how to walk by faith, yeah. confront the devil, yeah. walk in victory, stand in your place in Christ, yeah. he'll come back and he'll put a worse yoke on your life if all you're moving by is what you're trying to figure out on your own and hoping a glory bomb will hit you and set you free. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I'm not saying don't go get the glory bomb. Go get it. But I'm telling you, you need to be taught. Yeah. Jesus will teach you himself if you'll sit with it. You come to church, he'll teach. if you study Jesus' ministry, he taught more than he did anything. Because he knew, i got three and a half years here, I'm out of here, and if these people don't have a foundation of the Word in them, the things are going to start happening in a wrong way, and they're going to cut and run. They're going to think that, you know, this was just, you know, it's that same nonsense you hear all the time. Well, it was for a time, and now that doesn't happen anymore. Paul called those doctrines of devils and doctrines of, of, of men. Yeah. In Hebrews, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 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 I'm rabbit trailing again. Give me back over here. So it says he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, verse 16. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord, this is Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim and preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year. Everybody say year. Year, year. year of the Lord. Now this prophecy here, this, this utterance of, out of Isaiah's mouth by the Spirit of God that was released into the earth's atmosphere, that Jesus stepped into on that day of visitation, or that day, that fullness of time, he began to... 
Well, let me, let me go ahead, and I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have stopped right there. He began to, to talk about this. Look at verse 20. It says, He closed the book, he gave it to the minister, and sat down. The eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, everybody say this day. <laughs> Time again. Time, right? Not verse 19, acceptable year. Verse 21, this day. Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Amen. Yes. What he was telling them is, is that this scripture from whatever, how many hundreds of years ago it was spoken by Isaiah and recorded, up to right now, this scripture was a promise. It was a future, it was God letting you know what's going to happen in the future. But today, I have stepped into a season of time and I am here now and now this scripture is no longer just a promise this scripture is a right now reality yes. you are in the acceptable year of the Lord yes. and every Jew that heard him there every second temple Jew that heard him part of the reason we have so much trouble understanding the, uh, the gospels is because we don't think like they thought back then they understood when he said acceptable year and you can look it up and study it he meant jubilee yes, yes. Jubilee was every 50 years, at the end of 50 years, you, there was an erasing of the board in the nation. Yes. If you, you know, you had your inheritance, it was given to your family uh, through Joshua, and that land was your inheritance, and you worked that land, and God, and you, as you worked that land and served God and obeyed God and worshipped Him, God blessed the work of your hands, God blessed you, He prospered you, you had this cycle of life that God wanted you to have. But somehow people, just like today, will make bad deals, get in situations. Sometimes they get in so much uh, debt, they have to lease their land to somebody else and even go work for somebody as an indentured servant to try to pay off their debt. So they get locked up in a bondage situation that God never intended for them to have it. Have. But every 50 years, they would blow the Yovel, they would blow the Jubilee trumpet, <clears throat> the long blast of the trumpet. And when they did that, it announced to the whole nation... We've come to Jubilee. And Jubilee is every person that's in bondage, even if they still owe money, they're set free. The debt's, debt's wiped out. So you get to leave that, that farm you had to work on, that indentured servant, that slavery position, basically, and go back to your place. This is the year of Jubilee and all the captives are set free. Then when you went back, you reunited with your family. You reunited with your home, your town, your village. Those people that God put you with to have your destiny with. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 And then lastly, you got your land back. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. You, got a, 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 you got to start all over. But for that year of Jubilee, you didn't plan anything. You didn't reap anything. For a year, you took a year to get to, to walk away, go back home, reunite re with your heritage, yeah. and repossess your your land and your inheritance. Amen. And then in the following year after that, you started that cycle over of being blessed and walking with God in the fullness of what He had for you. Yes. Amen. So what Jesus was saying here is that this day is a fulfillment of this thing that you you rehearsed and you practiced, naturally speaking, all these years. Now I've come, and I'm Jubilee, and now you can be free from anything that holds you in bondage. You can reconnect with your destiny and your lineage and the calling of God upon your life, and you can have the fullness of what God has for you in inheritance. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you can't shout about that, we'll raise you from the dead later. Amen. Now notice, he was very emphatic about time. Verse 21, this day. Yes, yes, yes. See, that's what made him so mad. They got mad. He went to his home church and they got so mad at him they tried to kill him. <laughs> now who wants to be the preacher? Amen. It says he began to say in verse 21. At least hear the matter through. You may not agree with it first, but at least hear the matter all the way through. Amen. Verse 22, And all bear him witness, and wonder at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now what happened here? There was this real quick calculation in their minds. 
because they had religious minds, not righteous minds, not minds that were filled with God's revelation. They didn't know what time they were. They didn't know what kairos they were in. They knew what natural time they were in. They knew what the Romans were doing. They knew what the, the perverted priesthood at the temple was doing. Jesus, three and a half years later, when he went in and cleansed the temple, he said, you turned this thing into a den of thieves. No wonder the glory of God wasn't there. No wonder the spirit of revelation wasn't on the land. So you can't look around you all the time and judge what time it is with God and what you should be doing based on what's going on, even in the church sometimes. Get your eyes off of people and get your eyes on God. God's going to use people you wouldn't think He'd use, and He's not going to use people you would think He would use. Quit trying to figure it out. It's up to Him. You just listen to Him about you. Have a servant's heart. Be humble. And let Him promote you and open doors for you and do what He wants to do with your life. Amen. If I'm telling you right now, if you take that advice, that's going to save you a whole lot of grief and stress and strife. Yes. Amen. 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 Help us, Jesus. If you think you've got to push things, you're wrong. Amen. We're to be led by the Spirit, not pushing the people. Amen. 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 You know, people decide to leave this church <clears throat> for good or bad reasons. I let them go. You know why? I don't fight with them. I don't get mad. I don't... You know, back by the they're always running the shuttle to the church. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm not God. Yeah. And I don't know why they were here or why they left. Yeah. I may know some natural things about it, but really God's the only one that knows why. Right. He might have been blessing me by making them leave. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Or they might be wrong, missing God. Yes. And yes. so I just bless them, pray for them. I mean, if the Lord speaks to me, and I have had him on a few occasions, speak to me and said, that person's going to miss me, and you need to warn them. But it's usually before I even know <coughs> to think about doing something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, what well, we don't get, well, I'm gonna, I'll, just a short rabbit trail, okay? <laughs> if we don't understand, God puts us in a place where we're going to stretch and grow and learn. Yeah. And many times that means things, certain things have to be corrected in us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's get back around. So I told you, short rabbit trail. Notice verse 22, gracious words. Something about his words were full of grace and power. But instead of taking the witness of the spirit of the grace that was in those words, they immediately shifted back into their natural mind and said, wait a minute. Yeah. This is Joseph's kid. Yeah. I watched him grow up here. Mm -hmm. I saw him riding his skateboard down the cobblestones. Right. Riding his donkey. Too late at night or something. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Hee hawing out in front of my house. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Jesus would never do that. Oh, really? Yeah. Anyway. I can't think of Jesus was alive today. He might be riding a Harley around. You never know. <laughs> That's most of religious minds, but anyway. Yeah, he might wear jeans. It's not this Joseph's son. Now that was wrong. Yeah. He was not Joseph's son. Joseph was his stepfather, if you want to use that terminology. He was the son of God. See, if when you walk in the Spirit, you pursue God, and you want to know what who God is, what He has, what's going on right now, not so you can think you're some big shot for God and telling everybody your wonderful revelations, but because you don't want to miss God. Right. Amen. I don't want to be a fool. Right. Amen. I don't want, when my life is presented on the fire of the Holy Ghost altar at the end of this thing, for all of it to be burned up, and i got a couple of little pebbles over here that I, where I didn't miss God. I want it to be you, something He's done that will last, that will stand the fire. Yeah. Amen? Yes. Praise God. Yes. So He says here in verse 23, He said to them, You will surely say to me in this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we've heard done in Capernaum, do also in your country. And He said, Truly, truly, I say unto you that no prophet is accepted in his own country. Notice it's no prophet is accepted. What do prophets do? Prophets are called to understand 
the season spiritually to prophesy forth the yes. purposes and yes. will and plan of God. There is an element of foretelling, a lot of foretelling, but there is an element of foretelling and even seeing into the future yes. to a certain extent. Sometimes yes. God lets you go out there away. Sometimes it's just, you know, a, a, a lesser thing. But the prophetic mantle upon Jesus, right. he was operating in that prophetic mantle because he knew the season yeah. and he knew where they were all to go. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't, he says, he, when he answered them by saying, you told me, if you're really this person that's done all these signs and wonders we've heard about, let's see you do it, prove it. You got any anointing preacher? Let's see it, prove it. You'll never get anything from God having that attitude. That's right. No. Never. Because what you're doing is the same thing the children of Israel did in the wilderness. Can God really provide food in the wilderness? Yeah. It wasn't that they were asking for food that upset God. It was the they were actually mocking God yes. in unbelief. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I could really go off that. I mean, the rabbits are running everywhere this morning. <laughs> They're wanting me to chase them. But he brought her right back. And let's read verse 25. But I tell you the truth. Many widows, covenant women. Widows, but they were covenant women. And in, in their covenant, even under the old covenant, provision was guaranteed through the covenant by God. Amen? Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, a prophet. He's talking about the prophet, prophets here. When the heaven were shut up three years and six months with great famine, and there was throughout the land, people were starving to death because of no food, no water. But unto none of them was Elijah said, except, except Sarepta, unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. There was one woman who believed in the covenant enough to take a chance yeah. to give a preacher part of her, last, her and her son's last meal. Yeah. Now see, the world and the carnal church would look at that scenario and go, look at that preacher. This poor woman starving to death. And some grubby, you know, money-grubbing, uh, prosperity preacher is asking her to give him part. He wasn't asking her to give him something for that reason. He was trying to get something to her through the anointing that was upon his life. And if you read the story, you know he did. Amen. Yeah. See, what was Jesus doing? He was turning this thing right around and putting it right back in there. Like, it's not about whether I can do anything or not. It's about, are you going to have the same attitude this woman had? Yeah. Yeah. Or are you going to miss the day of your visitation? No you know, you, and then, well, let's read the next verse, verse 27. Many lepers were in Israel in the day of Elisha, the prophet. Elisha is the one who followed Elijah as the prophet of the nation. And unto none of them were, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. There were many covenant people dying of leprosy. But there was only one guy, and he wasn't even under the covenant. He was a Syrian. He had fought against Israel. He had a little Jewish girl that he'd taken captive as a slave in his house. He developed leprosy, and she looked at him and said, It's too bad you're not back over in Israel. There's a prophet over there that has a healing anointing on his life, and he would recover you. He would help you get healed. So he, this name of the Syrian, this big general, he goes over in there, and he brings the big entourage <clears throat> he's going to make a big splash. He's going to impress this prophet of God with who he is. <laughs> and before he got there, God spoke to Elisha and said, don't even, don't even talk to him. Send your servant out. Yeah. And let him talk to him. Now that was like spitting in his face. Yeah. <coughs> and he flew into a rage. You know the story. He flew into a rage. And his, his servants and his people that were helping him finally calmed him down and said, listen. If he'd said for you to do something hard, you'd have been right in there. Because see, pride wants to do something to yeah. accomplish it themselves. Yeah. Right. So people will look at me and see what a great one I am. Yeah. 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 Moving right along since that went over real big. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, he just asked you to do something humble. Go over here to this muddy river and dip yourself seven times. And he did it. And he was made whole. And then he tried to, you know, he was so thankful... He tried to give him a bunch of clothes and garments and wealth and stuff. And, and the prophet goes, nope. It's not time for that. It's not time for that. Now there's where a prophet received, refused to receive an offer. It's not always time to receive an offer. Right. Exactly. I remember Marilyn Hickey years ago. How many of you know who Marilyn Hickey is? 
she's up in her 80s now, but I remember her telling the story how that she was praying and believing God for clothes, and you know, when they were started, first started the ministry, and they were struggling financially, and this one lady called her, a wealthy lady called her and said, come to my house, I have some dresses for you. And she said, she piled up a pile of dresses, just beautiful quality clothes, and gave them to me. She said, I put them in the back seat, and I went home, and she said, I got home, and God said, take that back. She said, what? I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> he said, that woman gave you those clothes with a wrong motive. And you take it back. And she's like, oh. And she put them in the car took it back. The lady, of course, didn't understand. Most people that are in pride don't get what's going on, usually, most of the time. And... The Lord, of course, moved later on and blessed her and, and did things for her. But see, there's a time. We have to stand in that place of listening to God doing yeah. things His way. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, that's another rabbit trail, isn't it? Yeah. The verse, in verse 27 here, notice it says, Many lepers were in Israel in the time. That word time means to superimpose. God superimposes over whatever's going on in time in the natural realm. He superimposes his anointing, his will, his plan, his purpose, his season. Yes. Right. And if you understand that, you're able to tap into that and walk in that and be blessed and be a blessing. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. But see, he says here, there were many people that had covenants with God, dying of leprosy. But they didn't know where the, what time they were in. Yeah. They didn't yeah. know what to do. Right. They didn't know how to do it. Are you here? Yes. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> I meant to mention this. Uh, where Jesus said, this day these scriptures are fulfilled in your ears, back up in verse 21. <clears throat> the word fulfilled there. This day. Now, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The word fulfilled means, in the Greek, it means to cram a net full like a fish. Mm. It means to make replete or to make, uh, well, to be well supplied. To execute an office or to finish a task. Jesus was the fulfillment of that Isaiah 61 scripture. Now he, he said to declare the jubilee, the day of the Lord. He stepped into the earth to become that jubilee. And then he went to the cross to see to it that what happens in jubilee would happen forever. That's why when you study the blood, you study the seven times he bled, every one of them paid a price for another area of life to be reconciled to God so that you and I can stand up today, 2,000 years later, and say, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in, in my period, in my time. By his stripes, I'm healed. That jubilee freedom is still there. Yes. But now also, there's a timeline for us in our lives in what he's leading us into and causing us to do. Yes. And wanting us to walk in. I've heard some folks say, and, and I understand because I felt this way myself at one time, I don't believe it's, that there are spiritual seasons. Now, I believe Jesus finished it all and that's it. Well, let's, let's take a woman who's 65 years old, her daughter has a child, and she becomes a grandmother. Why wasn't she a grandmother before she was 65? Hadn't happened in time yet. She couldn't say she was a grandmother, naturally speaking. Right? right. right. See, eternal truth is eternal, but where the call of God and what God wants to do with us individually, in our churches, ministries, in our nation, and in this world, it, he's still working within that time to bring a fullness of time. And there are still those seasons where he reveals, this is it, step into it, and these things will start to happen. Yes. Right. Yes. Now he starts prophesying it many years before. Yes. I remember back in the, you know, the late 70s when I started to get my life squared away with God and moving with him. <clears throat> I would hear Kenneth Hagin, who was in his, I believe, 60s at that time, late 50s, early 60s. He would, be, he would begin to prophesy about the day coming when a people would rise up and the glory of God would be upon. He began to prophesy about the glorious church. And he just kept prophesying that year after year after year. I never heard him say, this is the time. Right. I heard him say, there is coming. There's coming. 
And in recent times, the Lord brought me back to some things. I won't go into all the details of it, except to say, he began to show me, he said, Kenneth Hagin was one of those who had experienced the, the mighty outpouring of healing in the 40s and 50s that came out of the Azusa Street move initially, that Holy Ghost dominated, powerful, glorious thing that God was doing that ended in the 50s, and then there was this gap over into until God began the charismatic movement over in the 70s. He bridged that gap and was helping the younger people like me come into an understanding of a spiritual season that not only was, he was reconnecting us with our heritage. Do you believe you reconnect with your heritage? And then he was prophesying about there's going to be a fullness of the restoration of your inheritance as the people of God, and that's going to be called the Glorious Church. And we are now stepping into, and we are in, the very first part of that. <coughs> people think, you know, the way revival is taught, and the way history, people talk about history in certain revivals, they think that just people were just going along in their daily lives one day, loving the Lord, and all of a sudden, kaboom, revival started. And all these powerful, massive things happened. It didn't happen that way. None of them happened that way. If you study the history, just like the Bible says, not to despise the days of small beginnings, those things started as a small seed. They started as a small sprout, as a small manifestation. And all of a sudden, they began to bloom forth and grow up. And when they grew up and the fruit was there and people heard about it and things happened, all of a sudden it got in into this place where it was just like a big snowball rolling down a hill that you don't get in front of that you can't stop. Yeah. We are now in a season. And I don't have time to go into all the reasons that I'm saying this this morning. But I'm telling you that there's a jubilee for the United States of America, yes, there is. for the body of Christ. Yes. Yes. See, Jesus, think with me for a minute. Jesus came to the end of his life. He walked. He was a prototype of the glorious church. Yes. He had the anointing without measure. Everything about him was the glory of God. Everything he said, everything he did, it was all spirit-led. It was all God. Amen. He never sinned. Come on, that's why he could be the sacrifice. Yeah. But thank God he never sinned. That's right. Otherwise we'd be going to hell still. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so he came to the end of his life. The Greeks, the Greeks were the ones that started the Olympics. They're into the Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> What, what Arnold used to look like. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and they, you know, they used to, I mean, they, did you know they used to do the Olympics naked? Yeah. I mean, they were into glorifying the body, weren't they? <laughs> Didn't even wear a pair of gym shorts. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but it was all about, you know, and like they would have these events when they first started. I mean, they were, they, people, these people, we talk about being committed to the gym, that those wrestling matches went on until somebody died. Right. Not until somebody said uncle <laughs> or tapped out. <laughs> you killed that person. That's how you won. That's pretty radical right there. Yeah. And at the end of Jesus' life, some Greek people, Greeks, came and said to his disciples, we want to see Jesus. In other words, they're thinking, man, we've heard all these things about him. He must be a specimen. <laughs> and Jesus, he knew where they were coming from because when the disciples came and said they want to see you, he said, tell them that... Basically what he was saying, without me trying to quote the scripture exactly, because I can't. He said, tell them that my body's like a seed. It's going to go into the ground. It's going to wither and it's going to die. Without the, without the you know, the spirit in it. Now his body, of course, was kept incorruptible. But he didn't have life in his body for those three days. Amen? Amen. And, and then he said, just like that seed, something glorious is going to come up out of the ground. When you plant a seed, the first thing that happens is it dies. And then it, it begins to grow roots, and it begins to spring yeah. forth. So what he was saying is, is there's a process that I'm sowing myself as a glory seed. Yeah. Yeah. He came forth in, from the glory. The Bible says that he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And he became the glorified one. He got a glorified body that can eat fish and walk through walls. That can be in Madeira one second and 
Scotty beam me up, be in L.A. the next second. Amen? Amen. Amen. He got that. And he then talked, and he, th those from John 14 on into John 17, he was doing a lot of rejoicing about the future because what he was saying is, I'm sowing myself as a glory seed for a glorious church harvest. The church is his harvest. That's why the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost to begin a process in the church to where the church could come forth in the fullness of glory. That first generation had a powerful, glorious move, but it got interrupted when the church decided to join the politics. And even got to a place called the Dark Ages where they hid the scriptures away and you couldn't, if you were a common person, you, you weren't smart enough to even read them. So the Word of God's hidden. Yeah. The light of the world's hidden. And all this crazy darkness and stuff happened, but then, praise God, there became a restoration and a reformation yeah. through Martin Luther yeah. about 500 years ago. And God began then to restore progressively. If you study the revivals, He began to re, re, uh, progressively restore the things that the, the first generation operated in, that Jesus died for, to the church. And He's bringing bring, it all back now to where we're at a place now that the only thing that needs to happen is fullness of glory. Yes. Yes. And the Bible says yes. Jesus is coming back for a glorious Amen. church. Amen. What does that mean? That means a church that when you look at them, you see Jesus. Yes. Even the first generation, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen? So what does that mean to us? That means we are living in a time. We are living in a place where God is saying, step into your season. Yes. Now what does that mean? How do we do that? You know, I hear people say things like that, and I'm going, well, that's great, but how do you do that? You know why preachers don't tell you how? Because they don't know how. <laughs> you got it. It means something different to everybody. Yeah. How you step into your season right now and begin to function there has to be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to lead you there. Right. But you've got to be willing to go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, the devil wants us to do the bench warmer thing. Yeah. Right. Well, you're saved. You're sanctified. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You're on your way to heaven. Shouting <laughs> victory. Thank God for that. I'd rather have that than the other thing. Yep. But, well, I'll just, okay. And you just kind of, you just do that. But see, if you get with God, He's going to say, I want you to start doing this right here. Yeah, man. <laughs> Amen. I want you to begin to, that you know, true. He may tell you, I want you to go over to that school and volunteer and read to the kids yeah. through the adopt school program that the MMA is a part of. Or He may say to you, I want you to go to the old folks' home and start singing to them like my dad does. Yeah. Or He may say to you, I want you to just, uh, you know, turn the TV off for a couple hours and yeah. spend some time with me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Or he may say, I want you to go sit down and talk to your pastor and let him talk to you about some things and pray. See, there's a place, not that you're going to figure out, forget you. You've already, your life's a mess because of you already. Amen. 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 In some areas. Amen. I'm not saying it's all messed up. You understand know what I'm saying. But how, how do we step through that door? How do we come to that place? The Holy Spirit will have you do some little, probably simple thing that makes absolutely no sense to your mind right. or how you would normally do things or maybe even the people you would hang out with or whatever it might be. And that's going to be a connection yeah. <laughs> to release you into what He has for you. Amen. Amen. See, we're supposed to be letting Him have our life. Yeah. <laughs> Not us coming and saying... Oh, I'm yours on Sunday, and I'll, I'll try to be a good Christian during the week, Lord. I'll try to live by your principles, and I'll try to, you know, do the best I can. Well, that's good. But that's not all. 
You will get bored doing that. Come on. Yes, sir. The devil will start working on your mind. And you'll write some song like they wrote way back. Is this all there is? How many of you are old enough to remember that? Man, I must really be old now. I don't go to church because it's just kind of boring. You know why it's boring? Because you're boring. Right. It is. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying I can't be boring sometimes, you know. As I'm, you know, I'm up here saying things that bore you or whatever. I don't know. We have a snoring and non-snoring section. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sit by her and you won't be able to go to sleep. <laughs> Good. But see, the devil always wants you to look out here. Well, it's because of this. Because of that. Well, I can't do it. Well, what if that happened? What? No, it's Jesus, here I am. Yes, that's it. Jesus, here I am. You know, Jesus, uh, well, let's go to Luke 19. I'm sorry, am I taking too much time? No. no. Okay, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> Luke 19. I told you, we need to hear this. I know this is important. Yes. Luke 19. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry. Actually, it was on the day of the of what we call Palm Sunday. If that was a preordained, that was another one of those fullness of time things where Jesus was to be received by the nation as the King Messiah. If they were walking in the revelation of the Kairos they were in. But they weren't. So he comes in on this donkey. The people that got it were throwing their coats down and waving palm branches and, you know, calling him King Messiah and, you know, all the things. And the people that were running the show at the temple got ticked. Got mad. Do you hear what they're saying? Yeah, I hear what they're saying. They're saying what God's saying. You dummy. That's what you would have wanted to say. Right. Amen? Yeah. But they didn't get it. So look here in chapter 19 of Luke. Look what it says here in verse 41. When he was come near, he beheld the city, the city of Jerusalem, and wept over it. Say, if you had known, even you, at least in this thy day. He's talking about that Kairos, isn't he? He's not just talking about a moment in history. He's talking about an intersection of the eternal purposes of God in a time and a place. If you had known, even had known, even thou in the at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto your peace. I wanted to sh shalom your life. Yes. I wanted to <coughs> fix everything. Shalom means. Everything that's broken is fixed, and everything that's out of line is realigned so that you can have the peace of God in every area of your life. Amen. He said, that's what I came to do here. But now, he says, they're hid from your eyes. You're judging out of your natural mind. You're deceived by the enemy. You don't know who I am because you haven't searched the Scriptures. Jesus told at one point, he told the Pharisees, he says, you think you know what you're doing, but go search the scriptures because those scriptures are talking about me. Yes. 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 Amen. Yeah. They're hid from your eyes. See, we have natural eyes and we have eyes of understanding. I humbly pray, God, open the eyes of my understanding. I don't want to be a fool. Yeah. I don't want to walk around and act opposite of you because I can't figure it out. Amen. 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 Verse 43, for the day shall come upon you that your enemy shall cast a trench about you and compass you round about and keep you in, on every side. That he was prophesying about the Roman armies that were coming. What was it, 30 years later or something like that? They came in and they circled the city and they starved the city out. They built a trench. They built a, 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 a what do you call it, those ramp things. They went in and they murdered many of the people. They tore the temple down to the ground level and stole all the gold and all the things that were in the temple. And then they took the people that were still there, enslaved them, and scattered them to the four winds. And the Jews did not come back to their land and become established as a nation until 1947-48. Yeah. Jesus had preached to them before, and he said, when you see the army surrounding, flee to the hills. Yes. And those that believed in him and, and understood who he was, 
They believed that prophecy and studied back in history. They headed for the hills. There's a time to head for the hills. Amen? Amen. And they were able to not have to leave and be either murdered or taken into bondage. There was a Jewish presence that remained in the land even over those that, that uh, long period of time. You know, people today that are against Israel try to act like the Jews showed up in 1948. They've been there. They've been there thousands of years. That's a whole other story. Verse 44, shall lay you even with the ground, your children within you, and shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Now look, why? Why? Why, God? We always ask God why, don't we? Because you knew not the, the kairos, that's that word time. Of your visitation. The word visitation here literally means a time that a bishop or an overseer, Jesus was, he was their spiritual leader, right? The bishop or an overseer comes to inspect, to cover you, make things right, and restore you. The nation needed to be restored. Back to the way they should have been walking all along. God sent His Son to do that. But because they couldn't understand the spiritual season they were in, they rejected Him and actually fought against the move of God. And as a result, instead of them reaping the blessings and having the peace and so forth and so on, the enemy, they aligned themselves with the enemy and He came in and He did His thing in their life. Don't fool yourself. You align yourself with the devil, he will eat your lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Oh, come on. Come on. God deals with you about something. He says you need to forgive so-and-so. You better get it done. Because when you say no, but you're, you're shutting the door on God, and it's a swinging door. You open it to the devil and shut it on God. And the enemy is aligned with you. That doesn't mean he'll come in and the next day put you in a headlock and choke you to death. What that means is his plan, he hatches his plan, and he may have a two-year plan for you, a five-year plan for you, or a 20-year plan for you. But he will get done what he has set out to do. And Jesus said what he does is kill, steal, and destroy. I love you enough to tell you the truth. People today, they just think God's this big teddy bear, you know. Does he just, you just sit him over in the corner of your house, and every time you need to be comforted a little, you go hug your teddy bear. I feel better now. Let me go sin, feeling better. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah. And I'm not talking about being human and missing it now and then. God doesn't even look at that. Right. Right. It's about what's going on in here. See, I know what's happening in here. Yes. 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 I know when the Holy Ghost is talking to me about something. Yes. yes. And I know when the devil's trying to yep. beat me yes. up with something up here. Yes. Can I turn to one last scripture? Yes. 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 You're not going to beat the Baptist in the cafeteria anyway. Amen? Acts chapter 1. Just, I really feel like I need to share this just to end this today. Oh yeah, I forgot about that part. We won't, we won't do that part. Acts chapter 1. Jesus left, was leaving the earth. He was standing there talking to them. He was getting ready to ascend back up into heaven. Let's go ahead and uh, <clears throat> now let's start at verse in chapter one of Acts, verse six. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, "Lord, now look, here they are. They've been through all this stuff of Jesus, three and a half years, his whole ministry. They've seen him be raised from the dead. That you know, they've experienced him, uh, you know, teaching them and catch it, kept, you know, catching them up to speed all of these these days. And but look how they're still thinking." But they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time? They say, okay, well now we, we got this time thing finally. We got this figured out. We know our Cairo seat. Cairo seat. Will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Jesus says, no! <laughs> You're still missing it. He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times, and that's the word chronos, natural time. <clears throat> or the seasons, that word is kairos. See, he's blending natural time and spiritual season together in verse 7. It's not for you to know the natural time or the spiritual seasons 
which the Father hath put in his own power. He didn't say you couldn't know Kairos seasons. Sure. He said there's some things uh, that uh, in time and history and, and, and spiritual season that God has retained to himself, and you're not going to know. See, they were trying to get God to do what the Bible says that no man knows. You, nobody knows the time or the season. Or the day, I'm sorry, the day or the hour. Have you ever noticed that all these guys that write all these books and put all this stuff on the internet about what day Jesus is coming back have all missed it? <laughs> There's one out there right now. September 20, what is it, 7th or something like that. It's the day when Jesus is returning. It's not going to happen. Don't stay up late and look for it. Get a good night's sleep. You're wasting your time. Because no man will ever know the day of the hour. Paul says he's coming like a thief in the night. That is true. He's going to show up, it says, when you least expect him. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about, but I know that God's right and we're wrong. No. When we start trying to write 88 reasons that Jesus is coming in 2000, or 1988, how many of you are old enough to remember that book? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But he didn't leave him here. Look, verse 8. But... You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. See that the celebration of Pentecost was right out there 10 days, I think it was 10 days in front of it. That they'd been celebrating all these years in that cycle I was talking about. And he was basically telling them there's going to be another intersection of heavenly eternal purpose with natural time on that day of what that day represents that's going to explode something into this earth that's going to change everything for eternity. It's going to change you and change everything. But you shall receive power. This, this word power is miraculous, dunamis, or working, you know, the miracle power of God. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. A witness is a person who has evidence. Yeah. Yes. Jesus had evidence of who he was. His anointing, his mantle, his wisdom, his healing power. It was all evidence, his character. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And then he went up back to heaven, and you know the story, if you've been a, a Pentecostal or charismaniac for very long, you know that uh, Acts chapter 2, you've heard it preached until it's probably rubbed off, your, the ink's rubbed off your Bible. So the, sport, the, the Spirit was outpoured, signs and wonders speaking to other all the things happened, and the people go, wait a minute, wait a minute, verse 14. Or let's see, not verse 14, verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Thought they were drunk. Isn't it amazing how somebody gets drunk in the Holy Ghost today, and it's like, oh my God, fanaticism. Yep, that's true. That's just emotion. That's just... These people thought they were drunk on the day of Pentecost. Well, it was because they were speaking in tongues. You know, I hear people speaking language that I don't understand all the time, and I don't yeah. think they're drunk. So, <laughs> I hear, you know, you go up to Yosemite or places where a lot of people from around the world come, you hear people speaking German, you hear them speaking all different kinds of French. I've never looked at the guy and go, that guy's drunk, man. Look at him. That's true. They thought they were drunk because they were drunk. They were drunk on the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, now here we, go, here we go. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and listen to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk on what you think they're drunk on. Amen. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that. Which was spoken by the prophet Joel. See, what's Peter doing? He's doing the same thing Jesus did in Luke 4. He's saying, this day, this is fulfilled in your ears. Yeah. A new era, a new time, a new uh, a spiritual season intersecting the natural time has happened. This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel that shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in these days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke and so forth and so on and so forth. Amen. So what was he saying? He was saying 
the jubilee continues. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't end with Jesus' death. It doesn't end with the apostles' death. So that's one of the yeah. biggest lies the devil ever told the church. Oh, yeah. Well, we uh, Jesus doesn't heal today because that stopped after the last apostle. There is no scripture in the Bible that says that. Yeah. Well, uh, the Bible says that uh, you know these things will happen until that which is perfect can come and come, and we have the full canon of scripture now, so that's what's perfect. The Bible doesn't say that either. Amen. You know, you can make the Bible say anything you wanted to if you try hard enough. The Bible says Judas went out and hanged himself. And there's another scripture you can tag onto that that says, Go thou and do likewise. Yeah. Make suicide a scripture in the Bible or yeah. a doctrine of the church. Yeah, that's true. Right. We've got to rightly divide the truth, the Bible says. We need to rightly divide the word. So, what's the bottom line on all this today? The bottom line is this is that we have lived, in one sense of the word, in a jubilee time period since this day, right here. That's okay. happened yeah. 2,000 years ago. Okay. Within history, in that time, as we talked about earlier, certain things have happened, certain things, the enemy would steal certain truths. Right. He would, you know, get the church over in carnality or some other kind of thing. But now, and I don't have time to go into all of this, but now, this year, I know, yes. I know, and yes. I, sometimes hopefully I'll just take time and just share it all. I know that this year, right now, where we are and where we stand, there is an opportunity to step into a fullness, a fullness of time. Thank you, Lord. And move into things we have never moved in or experienced or seen. Suddenly are things we have ex experienced, but we've never experienced them on the measure that God wants us to experience them. And as he began to show me this, I began to understand what a few months ago, when he kept telling me, tell the people, I want you to let me elevate you so I can expand you. Yeah. Elevate you so I can expand you. What do you mean elevate us? I want you to let me lift your up, lift up your eyes to me, lift up the eyes of your understanding, come up to a place... Come with me to where I can begin to download into you and show you and yes. reveal to you things that you don't see right now about you or about your world or your life or about your calling or what I'm doing and wanting to do in the earth so you can take that in and yes. then you'll begin to walk in that from that perspective yes. and I will cause you to be expanded. I will cause your influence to be expanded. Yes. If God's called you to a money ministry, He'll give you more money to give. If God's called you to a healing ministry, He'll cause more healing to begin to happen. If God's called you to a prayer ministry, you'll walk into a place of prayer and fellowship with God that you've yes. never experienced before. Yes. But we don't get it sitting back saying, well, I wonder when this big revival God's been talking about is going to happen. And we don't get it by just focusing on signs and wonders. We get it by going and being with Him. See, the signs and wonders in the move should be a byproduct of your fellowship with Him. Amen. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yes. Word. That's the icing on the cake for knowing Him and walking with Him. Yeah. 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 Knowing His ways. Amen. Does this make sense to you today? Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. I'm excited about it. Yes. Yes. I'm excited about it. Yes. I'm excited about it. Last Wednesday. I was at home and I used to, a lot of times Wednesday is kind of my staff. Just the way my life is scheduled, the way things work, a lot of times Wednesday becomes that day where I'm able to just kind of stay home and rest and study a little bit and come down here for prayer meeting at night. Wednesday I was at home in the morning and had my head all set, you know, I'm, I'm all ready to go. I got my sweatpants on, my, you know, Giants t-shirt on. <laughs> And I kept having this prompting inside. Go to the church and pray. Go to the church and pray. I'm going to go to the church tonight and pray. No, go to the church and pray. So finally, after a couple hours, <laughs> I came to the church and prayed. And I just, you know, just sat down here, put a little worship music on, listening to the worship music, just sitting back, getting quiet. Before the Lord. It's hard to hear God make a noise. There's a time to praise, of course, but I, I just got quiet. And after about, and I really just, you know, I was just enjoying the anointed praise music, and 
not really hearing anything from God or anything. About 45 minutes down the, the timeline there, I heard this in me. I'm doing it. Yeah. I said, what? He said, I'm doing it. I said, he said I'm, I'm doing it. And he just kept saying that to me. I'm doing it. Yes. And at first I didn't catch on. Doing what, you know? But then I began to realize yes. that he, what he was showing me is the things that I've shown you about this move and about what's, you know, what season you're in and where you're moving into, I'm doing this. Yeah. And then he began to show me, he said, I have set myself, I am going to have what I have said I'm going to have. Yeah. Right. Now that didn't mean he could do it all without us. What it means is I'm going to do whatever I have to do in this earth to get that done. If I have to overrun some people that won't go with it and find others that will, if I have to go out and get every drug addict in the Dara saved and bring them in in order for them to be the people that will do it, amen, he said, I'm doing it. You never. You talk about determined, strong-willed. You never found anybody as strong-willed as God is. Now he's he's not strong-willed in a selfish way. He's benevolent. He's kind. He's merciful. He's forgiving. Amen. We all know that. But when he says this thing's going to happen, and he has said it in his word, basically what he was telling me is, you just lay back at me, because my first tendency. I'll just be honest with you about me. My first tendency is when I think about, even if I think about the church. Let's say the church. Getting up to a thousand people is like, oh my God, what a bunch of work. What, 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 you know. I start thinking about things I have to do. I was doing that one time. He woke me up in the middle of the night and showed me Moses. He said, where did I ever tell Moses he had to do anything? I said, I'm doing it. All he had to do is listen to me and do what I told him to do. But he was showing me Wednesday, this is going to happen. You can get in, you can get out, or you can get run over. It's up to you. Amen. But he loves us, and he's saying, open your heart to me, find out what I'm saying to you personally, and go with it. Don't stress over it. Don't worry about it. Don't stay up late, late at night, you know, chewing your fingernails. Oh, I miss God, I don't miss God. You don't have to worry about all that. Just say, here I am, Lord. I'm available. And he's not going to send everybody as a missionary overseas. <laughs> when I was a kid in church growing up, missionaries would come and they would always preach this heavy message about you need to answer the calls of the mission field. Some of you in this room are called to Africa to live in a mud hut. <laughs> and I'm back there like, oh God, please, not me. I don't want to live in a mud hut. <laughs> come to the altar. I ain't going to the altar. <laughs> I might end up in a mud hut somewhere. <laughs> but you know what? If that was a call in my life, I couldn't stay away from that mud hut. Yeah. 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 I've had people tell me, I, man, I wouldn't be a pastor for all of the tea in China. <laughs> so I would not be a pastor. That's who I am. Right. I don't have to make myself get out of bed to do that every day. That's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> And the call of God, that's who you are. Whatever God has you do. He may just tell you, you just keep going to this church, you keep praying for this, you keep doing this, you keep tithing, you keep this, you keep... That's an important part of the whole overall scheme. But it's a, it's a time, it's a day, it's an hour, we're in a spiritual season, and God is telling us, open up to me and just step forward. And sometimes all you have to do is just say yes. For things to start happening. Now this has come back to me several times during this message. He's going to come to some of us and he's going to connect us with people and situations that we will look at and go, what in the world am I doing here? How did I get here? I've had that happen to me in the past and some things, but this is different. This is has to do with where you, it's your starting point for going forward. 
It's that open door. We've heard a lot about the open door, the key of David, and all this. But God has a way. Listen, I would, you know, my going forward, my door in 1983 was to come here and start a church. If you would have asked me a month before I understood that, what, what I, you know, are you supposed to go to Madera? So are you kidding me? I don't want to go to Madera. I've, I've worked up there and done some things. And I'm not impressed with that town. I mean, it was okay. It was just Madera, but... But yet, that was the thing I had to do. And that I had to fight my natural man. Yeah. I had to fight the devil. After I got here, the devil tried to drive me out of town. Amen. But God is going to connect you with people. Don't yes. try to do it yes. yourself. Yes. You're going to get connected with the wrong people. Yes. Yes. Right. Let the shepherd lead you. Don't push it. Amen. Yes. Where he leads you, you will follow. What he feeds you, you will swallow. Amen? Amen. You let him do it, but at the same time, as soon as you know, as soon as you have that witness, as soon as that door opens, go through it. Yeah. Yeah. And many people in here have been frustrated because God has purposely shut and closed off and kind of cornered them in or surrounded them in, and some things that you thought were going to happen before this time haven't happened, and some things aren't even working anymore, and it almost seems like you're kind of in that you know, that dead space or that dry place, but God's saying, no, 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 no. This is just the place from where the last door closed to where the you go into the, this door that's going to open. So just get your eyes on Amen. me. Listen to me. Spend time with me. Yeah. And you're going to, you'll find in the fullness of time that thing will click. Yeah. And you'll know. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for your people today. Thank you, and I thank you for the people that are here. Yes, they are a pioneering people. There are people that's pioneering this next move, this next thing that you're doing in leading the church into the fullness. I'm telling you, where we're going this time, folks, is called fullness. Fullness. And I'm not even sure I fully understand that. I don't know if I understand the fullness of that. But God is taking us there. It's a place the church has never been before. It's a place that even the early church uh, didn't have the opportunity to explore. But it's God taking us into that which He has saved for this last hour as He will demonstrate His fullness of His glory and power. So make yourself ava available. Do it even this day. And you'll begin to see things you haven't seen and you'll begin to watch and follow after His pathway. For the glory of the Lord is upon you even now and the Spirit of God is leading you there. Yes, says the Lord, just take my hand and don't let yourself be overcome with care. But move in that place with me and I'll get you to where you need to go. And you'll find yourself deep in my river, letting go and just going with the flow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So it's being assertive but yielding at the same time. Yes. Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> you see, there are churches that are pioneering these things in this day. Yeah. They're not all the same kind of church. They don't, not all, they don't all have the same emphasis. Some are full of young people. Some are full of older people. Some have a blend of both. But God is he's, he's birthing this. He's pioneering this. And he's People, I, I just know this, the people that are in this fellowship, it's not because we're better than anybody else in the body of Christ, because we're not. But there are people who want, are wanting to go on with God. And they're not going to fight the move of God. And that's why you're here if you're a part of this fellowship, whether you know it or not. And God's going to take you on into it. Will there be persecution? Yeah. Will you be misunderstood? Of course. But that just goes with it. Don't worry about it. You're not standing before men on the day of judgment. That's you're standing right. before God. That's right. And so you just yield to Him and let Him take you there. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise Thank you, Father. God. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Does the name Gregory mean anything to anybody here today? Does the name Gregory mean something to you? One of my first cousins, yeah. Have you been praying for him? My aunt is. She's. Your aunt is? He yeah. needs. Something. She asked me to pray for Okay. <laughs> that sounds like you've been praying for him. Come on. Been praying for him. Come on up. Anybody else? Gregory? 
Oh, yeah, I know you've been praying for him. Come on up. Anybody else been praying for a Gregory? See, this is what we were just talking about. Let the Holy Spirit dictate. Let him lead us. Amen. He gives the Spirit however he wants to. Have you been praying for Gregory? Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you guys just come close together? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. One of the things that's happening right now, I'm seeing it happen, is people who knew the Lord and backslid are starting to come back. People that haven't known the Lord, but it's their time now. Some of them are going to be the ones, <laughs> they're going to be wild. When they get to know Yes. Thank you, Father. Lord, I agree with these ladies as they stand here right now. All of us in this church right now, we agree with them. Gregory, we speak to you in the name of Jesus. We call out to you. We call your name in the realm of the Spirit. And I say in the name of Jesus, hear the voice of the Lord. Hear the voice of the Lord. Father, I thank you that the angels are dispatched right now. I know that the angels have been working with Gregory up to this point. But God, I thank you for that thing that you want to do, what you did with me in my work truck in 1979. That encounter, that confrontation, that thing, God, that gets Gregory's attention. Praise God. And Lord, we thank you that you have heard all the prayers. Your word says when we pray according to your will, you hear us, and we have the petition we desire. But we say, we decree right now in this season, we say, Gregory, come in. We swing the sickle of the harvest into his life right now. We say, and even though uh, Gregory may be saved, maybe one of these Gregories is already saved, we say that the harvest of the ministry and the purpose and the plan that God has for that man's life begins to come to pass in Jesus' name. Praise God. Now you just rejoice at what the Lord has said this morning. And you just watch God do what He does. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand. I want to pray for a man by the name of Tom Mercy. He was in a car wreck this morning. Continue to pray for Brother Steve uh, Jones. He's scheduled for surgery tomorrow morning. And then Donna, uh, his uh, sister Donna Moore, I always forget her last name. Donna Moore, and she's over in, uh, in the A Street uh, uh, home over there uh, getting better. She's actually, uh, the, the hospital thought she was going to die. And uh, called hospice, and they had to call hospice back and tell them forget it. Amen. So, uh, but she's over there working. They're working with her, physical therapy and so forth. And uh, we just thank you, Father, for your goodness. Lord, we lift up Tom Mercy to you. We ask you to minister to him whatever he needs from you, Lord. Let it happen in the name of Jesus. Thank you for these others, for Steve. We thank you for Donna and any other person that's being prayed for right now. We thank you. We set ourselves in agreement, Lord, that it's thus and so according to your word, your will, and your plan. We thank you for it. Lord, I pray that the things we've shared this morning, Lord, if I have uh, not given this clearly, I pray that the Holy Ghost will just bring it clearly to our minds so that we can step in right now to what you've called us to do. And we will not. I refuse to miss my day of visitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Pastor Mike will be ministering tonight. We will see you then.